Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Diana Sinton. I'm the executive director of UCGIS, and thanks for joining us in this session. It's uh, the last scheduled one in our virtual 2020 symposium. And I am super excited today to be able to introduce uh, this particular topic and my colleague, um, Dr. Timothy Hawthorne. I first met Tim when he was an undergraduate at Ohio Wesleyan many, many, many years ago, or maybe not too many years, but it's been exciting to see his, his career uh, as he's grown to these exciting um, things going on that we're going to hear about now. So Tim, I'm going to turn this over to you. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you're coming from today. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you a little bit of our work from a National Science Foundation Research Experiences for Undergraduates grant. Um, and so thank you again for taking the time out of your day. I know we're all very busy and juggling lots of responsibilities in this virtual um, world, so I appreciate your time today. Um, so as I said, we're going to share a little bit about our NSF RIU site. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the RIUs, they provide fully funded research experiences for undergraduates in the United States, either in U.S. fieldwork sites or internationally. So our work today, we'll be talking about our work down in Belize and Central America. Um, we've been fortunate to be funded by NSF since 2016 on this particular grant, and we just found out a few days ago that we're being renewed for another three years. So we are excited to share some of the um, ideas behind what we do. Um, I'll just um, put out a disclaimer before I get started that um, this presentation is, is kind of going to be a little bit different. It's not so much a reporting of results, but more talking a, a dialogue about our process and, and kind of um, how we approach community-based research and participatory research uh, abroad with our students and what we think is um, sort of the benefits of that work with our students and with our community partners. Let me move forward here. All right, so um, I, I'd like to open this presentation with just a quote, and this is a quote from about eight years ago now um, from a community partner that we worked with in some of my initial work in Belize prior to our NSF funding. And I think this quote resonates um, eight years ago, but also today, obviously, with some of the things we have going on around us here in the US and, and beyond. And he talked specifically about the role of outside researchers in international field settings. And he talks about how, um, you know, we're not trying to be the saviors from beyond. We're not parachuting in with answers to solutions, but we're really we're trying to think about ways we can enhance capacity and support community partners with new innovative technologies. So today I'm going to share a little bit with you about how we use GIS, drones, participatory science and citizen science to engage community partners and our students together to get at some of the issues that are rightfully pointed out by this community leader from some of the work um, in 2012 when we first started. So our NSF RIU site, um, just to share a little bit about sort of our transparent learning process for our students. Um, one of the first hallmarks of the program is that we are allowing our undergraduate students to kind of co-create the research project projects and process with us and with the community partners down in Belize. Our program is seven weeks. Um, we spend about a week and a half here in Orlando at the University of Central Florida. Then we spend about 30 days in country in Belize and then we come back to Orlando um, to work with our students for about two more weeks um, on the research projects as well. And one of the um, things I wanted to again point out, this is open to all U.S. students, so we are able to provide opportunities for students from any U.S. institution. And um, we typically fund anywhere between 8 to 12 students, depending on the year and depending on the projects as well. A second part of our process is that we engage in um, sort of a, a form of critical reflection where we're asking our students to not only think about what they're doing as researchers, but thinking about their positionalities and their identities in the research process and the challenges and limitations of doing community-based research abroad, which is a lot, um, uh, a lot to think about for um, many students that are new to research and especially research internationally. The third thing that we ensure that we do in our process and we're transparent about with our students and our community partners 
is that we really want to distinguish between some of the short-term impacts and processes that we're engaging in and some of the longer-term processes and impacts that we're engaging in. So this NSF RAU site, while it's a seven-week program for the students we select to work with, it's, it's embedded within a longer and much more sustained research project with community partners in Belize. So again, our work has been going on in Belize for about nine and a half years now. Uh, and so the summer work is just an extension of some of that larger work around community-based um, GIS and drone work as well. Um, the fourth point that we really stress in our RIU site is the notion that students are not only responsible for understanding the what, the processes, the methods, and the theories that they do with their research process, but we're also asking them to think about why they're doing this type of research, why they can do public and community-based scholarship with community leaders, with um, everyday ordinary citizens within Belize as well. So we really ask them to think a lot about the why behind what we and what they do as researchers as well. And I think this quote really summarizes to some extent what this is all about. Um, this is one of our former RU students. She's mentioning that um, one of the things that she found beneficial for this RU program was that it was an opportunity for her to work closely with communities and it really showed her how much um, knowledge and, and ideas that she gained from working hand in hand with community members and it really shaped some of her future. She's now a, a PhD student in a, in a prominent um, geography program here in the United States as well. And so what I'd like to do now is I'd like to take you to one of our field sites in Belize, the first field site that I'll talk about today. This is Hopkins Village, Belize. Um, it's um, sort of situated on the on the east hand, eastern side. You see the Caribbean Sea on the right hand side of this image, and on the left you have a um, freshwater lagoon and a savanna area. And then in in the middle is the village, which contains roughly anywhere between 2,500 and 3,000 individuals, depending on the time of year. It's a it's a very much a tourism based economy. Um, it's a traditional fishing village within Belize. Um, so sort of in the central part of the village, you see the, the more core um, traditional village setting and community setting. And this is what you're looking at here with our drone imagery. And then to both the north and the south sides, we have a lot of tourism development, um, some bigger resorts, some smaller resorts, and some also newer homes coming in from expatriates from Canada. Europe and the United States as well. So it's a community with a lot of really interesting social geographies and a, and a rapidly changing landscape. So we were invited in 2016 by the village council and a local nonprofit at the time to work in this village because of the work that we had been doing in other parts of Belize. And we were asked to come in and work with community members to understand some of the challenges around flooding, as you can see from the savanna and the lagoon on the western side, and also looking at um, pollution and beach debris along the coast as there was um, signs of erosion and also um, buildup of trash and, and debris along the coast as well. So we were asked to come in and, and engage in conversations and in um, technological research that could um, elucidate some of the community perspectives of this work um, as well. So I just wanted to share a, a couple quick points about the work in Hopkins. Um, I mentioned it's community-based and participatory. So a couple ways that happens in Hopkins Village. First, our students work with community members to go around um, map village structures, map culvert drainage ditches within the community, and engage in um, ArcGIS Collector, Survey123, um, creating open data portals and, and sites, and also traditional paper maps um, and conversations with community members to map what's happening in the village. Um, and I'll share a little bit more with you in a minute about the flooding data that they collected with community members. Um, the second part of this is um, capturing and, and representing local knowledge. So one of the hallmarks of our work um, in our RAU site and as part of our broader citizen science GIS team is the notion that we want to amplify voices from underrepresented populations, especially those from communities and in, in places like Hopkins Village that are um, often left out of funding discussions in Belize um, as a predominantly lower income community compared to other richer um, villages and towns within, um, within Belize. So, um, we wanted to make sure we prioritize local knowledge in, in many of the things that we did. So one of the things that you're seeing down here in the bottom right is our students working with community members to do 
participatory sketch mapping where they're using our drone imagery that's collected with community members to then on top of it map out some of the flooding hotspots that we're seeing within the community and I'll share more about that in a moment. The third part of what we do with community members is I mentioned that we're always trying to enhance capacity for technology within the communities in which we work. So here in Hopkins, this is a great example um, of some of the work we do with DJI Phantom drones and also Parrot Mambo drones um, for the kids as well. And so what we have done is we have trained several community members um, in the use of Phantom drones. We also have one of our drones that has been now, I think, two and a half years on site in the village as well when we are not in the village doing field work. And we've trained different community members, including our colleague Dirk here, who is a local photographer and tourism leader and also um, the representative for the Belize Red Cross. Um, so he and the previous um, chairman, Ted McCoy, over on the left there, are both fully trained in the drone work that we do and are able to provide drone imagery for the community. Also in the upper right corner, we have um, in the red shirt, Asani Palacio. Asani is a 17-year-old that has worked with us informally as part of our youth work in the village since 2016. And um, he is now a fully trained um, pilot with the drone operations that we do in Belize as well and provides drone imagery for his village and community as well. So that's another part of the technology enhancement and capacity enhancement that we provide as part of the work. So I wanted to share um, right here uh, really briefly a couple of some of the um, data and maps that have come out of this work with our undergraduates. And I'd, I'd like to point out that this, these next couple of maps have been created by our RAU students with guidance from me, but um, created mostly by them as their intellectual property. And so what we're seeing here is an example of one of many sets of data and, and visualizations of the community-based flooding perception. So we ask community members to use sketch mapping again to draw where they are seeing flooding, pooling water, um, and flooding over time in the community. And I think this is an example from one of our maps from the summer of 2017. And I'll just point you to the dark blue area. This is um, basically an aggregate of all the individual sketch maps from community members. And the dark blue is the area of sort of aggregation and consensus. So you can quickly see um, where this community knowledge individually comes together to create a collective story of flooding within this community. It's also important to note that this um, is really interesting to visualize over the more um, traditional data that you might find in GIS. So for example, the black and white dots on this map represent culvert drainage ditches. And so you can see the black dots represent drainage ditches that are either misfunctioning are malfunctioning or have uh, high amounts of standing water, trash, and debris in them. And so you can quickly see if you overlay those on top of the blue area, right, we have a challenge. And so one of the things that came from a map like this and the data from that summer was that in the future, um, within about a year, um, some village funds were secured from some additional UN funding and development projects to include new drainage and culverts within some of these high highly identified flood risk areas as well. So just one example, again, of the power of local knowledge and, and community members sharing through sketch mapping their ideas and their challenges that they're seeing within their community. Um, very much related to this, this is just another visualization of the same kind of idea showing um, community members were asked to identify where they felt um, drainage infrastructure could be improved. So you start to see sort of similar ideas. This was from the summer of 2018. Uh, the darkest green is kind of the area, again, of aggregate consensus where um, people suggested there was a need for more drainage and infrastructure um, as well. And so um, this has really been interesting and used um, quite a bit by the community leadership um, as they actually pave the main road that goes north to south in the village between the summer of 2018 and the summer of 2019 as well. So uh, again, trying to provide data and technology from community perspectives that elevate and amplify their stories that can support um, some of the eventual work that is being done in the village to improve um, infrastructure and improve flooding within the village. Um, I mentioned the drone work in Hopkins Village. Um, one of the interesting parts of the drone work is um, you know, we've worked in Hopkins now for about five years, 
So every year we've done a comprehensive drone survey of the village, creating high resolution sub-meter imagery for the village to show change detection over time with our community members. And from that work, one of the things that we heard repeatedly was the sort of multi-scalar connections between islands, um, about 20 to 30 minute boat rides off of the coast of Hopkins, um, and also areas south of Hopkins, and, and really a need from local fishermen, tourist leaders, and some business leaders in the community to say, hey, you know, we've done this really great work together with drone imagery in the village. Can it be expanded to support some of our work on neighboring communities and neighboring islands where we have um, tour groups going out, where we have families living, um, things like that. And so we created a side project with our collaborators in Belize called Open Reef. Open Reef is a project, it's a pretty ambitious project. It's designed to map um, vulnerable smaller islands within um, Belize. So we have successfully mapped about 200 islands and also several communities along the mainland coast of Belize as well with community partners to understand the changes that are happening in the coastal and um, island environment of Belize as well. Um, so, you know, here's an example from the imagery. We're training um, local groups, including the Southern Environmental Association, Coastal Zone Management, um, Fragments of Hope, and several other nonprofits and quasi-government organizations um, to do some of the work with our local community partners and citizens and also our undergraduate research team as well. Um, so that open reef work actually led us, and some of the work we did in Hopkins led us um, to southern Belize, um, just south of a, a big tourist town called Placencia, Belize. Um, about a 40-minute boat ride from there on the mainland of Belize is a, a smaller village called Monkey River. And so you can quickly see here from two comparative drone images, uh, Monkey River is a village that is experiencing a ton of coastal erosion from a variety of reasons. Um, some drainage rerouting from the uh, from an area north in a manufacturing plant, also some erosion from um, rising waters along the coast as well, and some discharge from a nearby river. And, and so there's been a ton of erosion, and what you see here, um, we were invited by Monkey River as part of our REU team last summer to document some of the changes in this village to do work similar to what we had done previously at Hopkins Village to the north. And so you can see um, imagery from 2018 on the top, um, I'll point you to the three homes that you see in this image, and then imagery to the bottom um, right, you can see the same three homes they have installed in the village with some grants from other funders, um, these geotubes that are basically um, kind of speed ramps in some way of, of rerouting water to protect their shoreline and protect some of these vulnerable residents uh, from this massive erosion that is happening. And so we were able to document those changes with the drone imagery. And then one of the things we were asked to do with our students, uh, picture here in the upper left, was to really recreate sort of the historical landscape of this village um, using our drone imagery as a base and then using sketch mapping with leaders and community members in Monkey River to identify lost property, lost um, paths and roadways within the village, and also um, some of the shoreline is, that is lost. So here on the right is kind of a snapshot of a larger map series created with community members and our students in Monkey River Village. The yellow um, represent buildings that have been eroded away in the last 10 years or so um, from this changing um, landscape. Um, the black lines are representing part of the coastline that, or I'm sorry, the black lines are representing um, roads and pathways that were in the village that have been washed away from this eroding landscape. And the bright red lines are representing the, uh, the approximate zone of the previous shoreline about 10 or 15 years ago as well. So again, I think this is just another example of the power of kind of the local knowledge and, and participatory sketch mapping with community leaders co-led by our students in our REU program. So as I kind of get to the last couple of slides here, what I want to stress is part of this participatory process is recognizing again um, that local knowledge is key to all of this. Um, we are providing technology support to amplify the voices of local communities that are involved in the research. Um, we are certainly not claiming to be representative of all members of the communities. It is you know, like any form of qualitative research and mixed methods research, it is representative of those voices at the table. But I am um, really pleased to say that we've had hundreds of community members in multiple communities, including 
Hopkins and Monkey River Village engage in this research over the last four years to share their stories and, and create these knowledge bases of local knowledge. So we share this work in a variety of ways through presentations like this to our academic colleagues. Um, we share them in presentations around Belize with NGOs and nonprofits, um, in national research conferences within Belize, and also um, with the, the um, U.S. Embassy and other um, government agencies within Belize as well to support not only the villages we work in, but to stimulate additional ideas for collaboration and open data sharing as well. Um, we also share a lot of our work uh, in more informal settings within the villages in which we work. So this image in the upper left is an example of a community meeting at a local restaurant. Um, just sharing in a more informal setting the work that we do and, and collaborating to discuss possibilities for future work and change. Um, we also share our work on social media. Um, Facebook in particular is a very active platform within Belize. Um, so we often share our imagery and have an online discussion forum around some of the imagery and the visualizations and the maps that our students create with our community partners. And finally, we have an open data portal through ArcGIS Online that provides the data sets um, and also links to the ortho mosaics imagery and we have a google drive site that has the actual um, imagery for download as well um, so you know part of this is about sharing data as well and so what i'd like to close with is just this recognition again that a, a program like this is really about engaging our students with our community partners it's it's demonstrating that even as undergraduates, you know, juniors and seniors that have come together as a team in a, in a very quick, rapid environment of seven weeks, this is the kind of work that can be possible when um, thinking about community engagement, partnership, and collaboration. And so I think this quote here from one of our previous RE students really summarizes the idea of working as an interdisciplinary team, working with community partners, and really strengthening their resolve, grit, and determination for more work that can benefit broader society as well. So I, I like to, when I give these talks, I like to really emphasize that um, in our work, we really strive for students to think about their work beyond just the academy, but also think about how it engages with society, with all of its opportunities and also its limitations as well. So um, that's a little bit about what our RAU site is about. Um, I hope you have enjoyed the, the, um, the presentation. And now what I'd like to do is open it up for q and I know Diana is going to um, unmute us here in a moment and open up the chat session. But I just wanted to point before we get to that, um, two things. First, if you'd like to learn more about our work and also the broader work of our team, um, you can visit our site at citizensciencegis.org to give you a sense of what we're all about and how we continue to amplify voices of underrepresented groups both in our research teams and with the research that we do with our community partners. And um, beyond that, i just like to pose just a more broad question um, for the audience to maybe think about, and that is, what does the future look like for these types of projects? Not just ours, but the types that you might be interested in as well. How does participation, citizen science, participatory mapping, how does that happen in this COVID-19 world? And I think that's something we are really um, struggling to think a little bit about right now as a team moving forward with three more years of this grant um, as well. So that's just a question I had to pose. Um, and now I'd like to stop speaking and open it up for Q&A from the audience. So thanks. And Diana, I'll turn it back to you. Super. Thank you, Tim, very much. So anyone in the audience, if you uh, would like, please, uh, from your GoToWebinar interface, feel free to raise your hand with a little hand icon, and I would be happy to unmute your microphone. And if you'd prefer um, a different way to interact, please feel free to write a question into the question space, and we will look at those. We've got our first question that's come in. Paddington, Hodson, Paddington I'm going to unmute you. Thank and you, Dan. You, yep, yep, go ahead. Hey, Tim, how are you? Hey, Paddington, good to see you, my friend. Good to see you, too. Hey, Tim, I really enjoyed your talk and uh, really appreciate the fact that you are giving students uh, valuable international exposure and uh, research work experience. Uh, I know that you are engaging local community members, but uh, have you ever considered bringing U.S. 
and Belize students together to collaborate on this other EU. I mean, on one hand, you do have students, and then on the other hand, you have community members. And I don't know how many of those community members are students. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that question, Paddington. Um, and I'm sorry, I glossed over this really quickly and in, in speeding through this, but um, we do have, um, outside of the funding from NSF, we also have provided some smaller amounts of funding from a smaller pool of money I have from UCF to support a handful of University of Belize students on our teams each summer. Um, so typically we have anywhere between two or three um, University of Belize students. And then as we move forward um, with the next three years of the grants, um, we will continue to do that with students. And we also have a University of Belize faculty member in natural resource management that has been sort of casually working with us. We're gonna formalize that relationship for her to join us next summer as well. So in addition to the community partners, we do have Belizean students as well. Sorry for missing that earlier. Sounds good. Hey, Diana, I have a quick follow-up question. Yes, yeah. please. Yep. Uh, so Tim, uh, uh, I know it's challenging, I mean, to work with uh, folks from a different country. Are there any challenges you experience in your efforts to engage uh, local folks? Yeah, I mean, um, we could talk all day about this. I'll, I'll just point to a couple really briefly. I think first and foremost, it's the um, the technology itself, right? I think many of us in the GIS world know this, right? It's an expensive technology. It's not always, um, you know, it's, it's many times cost prohibitive. So I think um, getting drone access, that was a big thing. You know, as we negotiated a formal MOU with the village leadership when we first started working in Hopkins, Part of the discussion was if we're gonna use drones in this work, we need a drone, right? And so we weren't able to provide that through the NSF funding um, because that would be a violation of um, the agreements um, of moving technology outside the US. However, we are, were able to provide funding through another entity to get a drone for the village. So I think technology um, is a huge thing. Um, and I think the second part obviously is just not being able to be in the village all the time. Um, you know, I do have over time, this has improved, I think, but just being offsite a lot of the year is really challenging. And I think that's where, um, you know, having leaders within the village and having community partners that work closely with us, I think they can carry on the work without us. So for example, um, this summer, we obviously had all our field work plans canceled, but some of the work is continuing without us. Um, some of the drone work, for example, um, some of the work on beach debris, which I haven't talked about today, um, they're going to be installing some recycling receptacles and I'm working remotely to kind of assist in that as well. So it's, I think that's another big, big element of this as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Paddington. Anyone else have any questions? While I'm waiting to see whether anyone types in a question into the chat, into the question space, Tim, I have a quick question. Um, how do you integrate some of these uh, activities around participatory mapping with your um, regular classes that you teach on campus with your students there? Yeah, great question. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we do, and even in like the intro first level GIS course is, is we ask students to think about the things that they care most about as students at UCF. So, um, you know, that goes in a lot of different directions, obviously, but we ask them how to kind of map that. And so we go around and start thinking about projects on campus where we can engage students. So a couple of other examples, um, one was there was a project probably about three years ago now in my intro GIS course where a bunch of undergraduates were really passionate about um, the challenges of skateboarding on campus. So they, they did um, through like a Reddit discussion and then some ARC Online work, they did like a, um, you know, the pitfalls of skateboarding on campus, which was really interesting. Another example was around um, our food pantry on campus. We have a, a, a pantry called Knights Helping Knights. And so our class was involved with that group to um, map the, the food donation boxes on campus and trying to understand if they were kind of optimized around campus and, and sort of improve some of their distribution networks as well. So I think those are two of probably the, the more um, prominent examples I can think of at the moment for the classwork. All right, and that's related just quickly to this last question here. Um, do you have any uh, top sets of tips for campuses or other faculty, faculty or campuses, who are trying to develop um, programs of this type? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, firstly, I'll just say as, as someone who's extremely passionate about this type of work, if any of you are interested in seeing this or any of our um, funded proposals, please email me. Um, you can find my info at our website um, on our contact page. I'm happy to share um, full um, proposals and reviews of the work that we've had funded, absolutely. Um, but in addition to that, I think the biggest advice that I would say is, you know, listening is the most important skill in all of this. Everybody thinks it's the technology, but it's really about listening to the communities in which you might be working and, and who you might work with. So I think, you know, not going in with this preconceived notion of what you should do, but really listen to community leaders about their concerns, their, their challenges. I think that's a big thing. And I would also say a second part is a lot of um, our, our work and a lot of the work that I think I started with as, you know, a, a grad student, as an undergrad, an early career faculty member, you know, before this really came at the work from a deficit perspective. And I think um, we shifted the terminology in which we talked about our work. So it's not just about sort of challenges and limitations in communities, but it's also about the good in communities and the opportunities in communities. So more of like an asset-based approach. So in addition to the things we talked about today, we also do a lot of work to um, document and work with communities to understand what their assets are, what their visions are, their aspirations are for enhancing their communities as well. So it's not just about you know the bad stuff that we all think about as researchers, but also emphasizing the good um, and the aspirations of community members as well. So I think those are probably my top piece of the, as advice. Excellent. I have a comment here just that's come in from Karen Kemp noting that um, the idea of remote field work, which uh, is referenced, I, I think this is probably in reference to your final comment here about ideas for the future of participatory mapping in our socially distanced world, that this was a um, uh, the topic of a working group of the AAG that's proposed a funded project to explore how remote field work and remote field trips might be produced collaborative, collaboratively with people in the places we want to explore. So, um, so maybe there'll be something else coming out of, uh, perhaps supported by the AEG with this. Karen, do you? Ha I'm gonna just to make sure that I said that correctly. Karen Camp, I'm gonna unmute you, so maybe you can just clarify what I the comment I just stumbled through. You got it exactly right, Diana. Yes, um, we had a fascinating conversation about virtual field trips, which evolved into virtual field work. And specifically the idea of in a distanced world, can we create collaborations, remote collaborations with people in the places we wanna go and have those people go take the pictures and take us on the field trips remotely. Um, so the idea was that it might give us a chance to build collaborations in all these other places. Um, given that we can't go there ourselves. So there there was very interesting discussion and, and some hope that perhaps we can get that moved forward within the AAG as a as a real project. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah, that's, that's really cool, Karen. Um, I'm really excited to hear that. Um, one thing I was gonna mention as well in, in relation to that kind of idea is one of my colleagues and good friends, Chris Atchison, who is a faculty member in geoscience education at University of Cincinnati. He's one of our collaborators on this project. Um, he founded an organization called the International Association for Geoscience Diversity. Um, and they have done some work around remote learning um, and making field work more accessible as well. Um, and I think he just mentioned to me the other day that he got some new funding to do similar kind of things to what the AAG um, in some ways might be approaching. So I'd be happy to connect you all um, as well. But yeah, I'm really excited to hear what comes from that AAG working group for sure, Karen. Excellent. All right. We are at the top of the hour, everyone. Thank you very, very much for your contributions and listening on this session. Thank you very much, Dr. Tim Hawthorne, for sharing with us your activities uh, with community-based research and the REU program that you run with in Belize. And everyone, uh, thanks for your attention during this symposium. This session has been recorded and we'll make it available on our symposium website shortly. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you all. Be safe.